Aquaman is finally here. And while normally a movie about Cal Drogo learning how to talk to fish wouldn't exactly pique my interest, the film serves as a very strange cultural artifact signifying the definitive end of perhaps the most elaborate and spectacular franchise failure in Hollywood history. I speak, of course, of the so-called DC Extended Universe, Warner Brothers' ambitious attempt to match the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe using the beloved DC Comics' pantheon of heroes. Unfortunately, ambition doesn't always equal success, something I first learned when me and my cousin John attempted to set up our own intercontinental backyard wrestling league, an endeavor that eventually ended with several broken limbs and one very awkward funeral. You guys okay? And so, in the same way that me and my young friends watched Sergeant Murder Boy ascend to the squared circle in the sky, so too must we watch as this botched abortion of a film franchise is scattered to the wind, leaving us asking the only question that can be asked. Who allowed this to happen? In the case of Sergeant Murder Boy, the answer is my idiot cousin John and his invention of the so-called gunchucks. For the DCEU, the answer is assuredly Hollywood director Zack Snyder, a man who showed us how it's possible to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the cinematic equivalent of stuffing a corpse in a freezer, not once, not twice, but three goddamn times. So today we'll be taking a look at Zack Snyder's DC trilogy, trying to figure out how you can take some of the most beloved characters in the history of American folklore and somehow produce something less competent than the average episode of Super Friends. So yeah, let's just get into it. Number one, Zack Snyder is an edgelord. Now this is a term some of you may not have heard before, and it's honestly a bit hard to define. An edgelord is somebody who thinks their attempts to be shocking are more profound than they actually are. Like that kid in high school who made Flash cartoons about Danny Phantom characters going on school shootings. Now it is possible to be edgy without being an edgelord. A good example would be a director like Tarantino, whose plots and characters are so intriguing that his use of stylish violence and profane dialogue accentuate his films rather than turn them into schlock. Did you notice a sign in the front of my house that said dead storage? No. But Zack Snyder, at least in these films, seems to lack Tarantino's self-awareness, demanding the audience indulge his thirst for shocking content without working to earn it. There are so many examples of this that I honestly had trouble deciding on the best one. There's the pivotal Watchmen scene he replaced with smashing a guy's head in with a meat cleaver, the time he said that if he were directing The Dark Knight, he'd have Batman get raped in prison. That's a real quote, by the way, you can look that up. But I think the best example of Zack Snyder going outside the boundaries of good taste comes from an early scene in Batman vs Superman. In that movie, Lois Lane is sent to Sandgafistan to interview a racist stereotype. While she's there, it's discovered that her photographer is secretly working for the CIA, an organization that has apparently made sure their agents will never lose their secret spy equipment by having it blink suspiciously 24-7. In the extended cut of the movie, we actually learn the name of this photographer, a name that will likely be familiar to longtime DC Comics fans. Miss Lane, Jimmy Olsen, photographer, obviously. In the comics, Jimmy is a young photographer working for the Daily Planet, who regularly finds himself in a variety of hilarious predicaments, like the time Superman forced him to marry a gorilla, or the time Superman refused to lift him out of homelessness, or the time Superman became his dad and angrily burned the sweater Jimmy bought him for Father's Day. Look, comics were kind of weird back then. Anyway, I'm sure Superman readers got a big kick out of seeing Jimmy in the movie. Looks like that lovable red-headed scamp sure is in some trouble this time. I wonder how I'll get out of this- Oh my god! They just shot him in the f***ing head! Jesus Christ! I honestly could not invent a better scene to explain Zack Snyder's approach to storytelling. The man is a parody of himself. Jimmy Olsen, photographer. It is scenes like this that set the tone for the entire trilogy, and that's a problem. Because while this kind of shocking content might have worked in a standalone Batman movie, the character at the center of this trilogy is Superman. And thinking you can go full Dark Knight with everyone's favorite flying Boy Scout just leads us to the next thing on our list. Number two, Man of Steel is worse than 9-11. 
Now look, Man of Steel is the closest thing Zack Snyder's DC trilogy has to a good movie. It's definitely not a good movie, but Michael Shannon does turn in a fantastic performance as General Zod, and the film has penis rocket ships, which is a pretty ballsy thing to try and get away with in a PG-13 movie partially designed to sell action figures to children. Now while the movie has a number of problems, perhaps the most obvious one is Zack Snyder's desire to explore what it's like when superheroes inhabit the real world. All the other movies I've made are, are relatively, you know, fantastic concepts. With this, he's a fantastic character, but I really said no. The way Superman is awesome is that if you believe that he's real. But what's strange is we already have a perfect example of what it's like when superheroes inhabit the real world. It's called Watchmen, a comic series for which Zack Snyder himself directed the movie adaptation. Watchmen showed us very clearly that the second you start trying to solve real-world problems with colorful costumed heroes, you just end up with a depressing farce. One where a giant blue god blows up fleeing Vietnamese soldiers, aging superheroes grow fat and alone, and all that talk of truth, justice, and the American way sounds like a sick joke when spoken beneath the looming shadow of total nuclear annihilation. I'm deep in Watchmen, right, I'm deep right, in right. Deacon constructing like superheroes. It's like, hey, do you want to make a Superman movie? It's like, well, I'm about to tear him down. Right, right, like, right. I'm gonna kill him. Right. I don't, I'm not interested in fixing him or making him interesting. Right. Like, he's the enemy right now. Point is, superhero comic books work because they know they are set in the realm of the impossible. When comic book Superman gets punched through a building, you know it's all just make-believe. But when you try to do the same thing in a universe you've spent two hours trying to convince the audience is a real place, you get what looks like a hundred 9-11s occurring all at once. Oh my god, that building probably had hundreds of people in it. Oh my god, oh my god, get out of the city, oh you're killing all these people. Now I hate to use this word, but it is honestly pretty gross to use imagery which so clearly invokes the specter of a national tragedy in a goddamn blockbuster superhero movie. I can only picture a team of Korean CG artists looking at file footage of Tower 7 falling and saying stuff like, all right, look at this closely. See, when, when the upper floors collapse, we need the fireball to be bigger. Okay, we gotta nail this thing, man. It's a Superman movie. So yeah, Zack Snyder's desire to make a realistic superhero movie, combined with his inability to recognize the boundaries of good taste, has resulted in the most shockingly tone-deaf action scene I think I've ever seen. Rather than pull me into Snyder's supposedly realistic superhero universe, all it's done is remind me that the real world is far too complicated to pretend that a magic sky god is coming to save the day. Which leads me directly into my next point. Number three. Superman is not Jesus. Now, I'm not a real religious guy. Not ever since I got kicked out of Bible camp for saying dinosaurs were more than 2,000 years old and refusing to sing along as the camp band butchered rock and roll classic Louie Louie. That being said, I've read enough of the Bible to know that trying to strongly insinuate that Superman is the second coming of Christ is f***ing ridiculous. Remember that part in the Bible where Jesus had to snap a guy's neck? No, of course not. If Superman was really Jesus, he would have let Zod beat the shit out of him with a whip while screaming, Daddy, hurt me plenty. Now, if you don't believe this is what Zack Snyder is doing, just look at the insane number of lazy religious allegories jammed into these films. Cross, cross, Superman is a fisher of man, giant laser beam cross. Batman with the spear of destiny. Classic T-Pose. Descending from heaven to save the sinners. Cross. Gotcha double cross. Superman with Jesus of Nazareth. That's Jesus, y'all. Seriously, Snyder was pushing this Jesus narrative so hard that Warner Brothers actually tried to market Man of Steel as a Christian movie, encouraging pastors to talk about how Jesus was the original superhero. I really wish I was making that up. Now look, the traditional Superman story does have a few New Testament parallels, most obviously being a child delivered from the heavens onto a virgin couple. But the good Zack Snyder had to push forward with what reads like an unmedicated 12-year-old's version of the Bible, where Jesus dies fighting the cave troll from Lord of the Rings, then after three days pushes the rock away from the cave so he can fight the final boss of Soul Calibur 2. Point is, in the same way I don't want to see 9-11 in my kids movie, I also don't want to get tricked into watching a superhero version of The Passion of the Christ. If I'm going to watch a Christian superhero movie, I'll just watch Bible Man. There's nothing trivial about Jesus Christ. Number four, 
Martha. All right, we have to talk about this scene. One that will surely go down in history as one of the most bafflingly stupid moments in the history of blockbuster cinema. Now this is supposed to be the most pivotal moment in the entire film. The climax of the movie's titular fight, Batman vs Superman. How will it end? And this is the answer? Superman with his dying breath begs Batman to save Martha. Save Martha. Then Batman, rather than consider that the world contains thousands upon thousands of Marthas, seems to make the assumption that Superman is playing a weird Kryptonian mind trick on him. Why did you say that name? What is going on? But the real tragedy here is that there is a perfect line for this situation. One that is so utterly obvious that I honestly believe it must have been in the script at some point, only for Zack Snyder to argue with his script writer that some nonsense about their mom's names would be better. The line that should be in the movie is, please save my mom. Now remember, the only real reason Batman has for wanting Superman dead is that Superman is an unknown element. He is a literal alien who descended to Earth one day, bringing with him doom and destruction. Batman is actually being completely rational when he comes to the conclusion that no matter how many space shuttles Superman might save, they'll never offset the fact that Superman could enslave the entire human race overnight. It's a risk not worth taking, especially since Superman refuses to reveal anything about himself, even going so far as to rip government satellites out of the sky so they can't track his movements. However, the revelation that Superman has a mom changes everything. Superman is no longer an unknown element. He's the adopted son of Kansas dirt farmers, a man who grew up on old school Christian morals and a big weepy baby who doesn't want his mom to die. With this one line, Batman would be forced to recognize that though Superman may not be from Earth, he's still essentially human. The fact that Batman knows quite well the pain of losing one's parents is really just icing on the cake. But instead of this beautifully simple revelation, we instead get this bizarre contrived version of it. Batman goes from being a total badass to a blubbering moron, while the audience is forced to wonder if Superman would be dead had his mom's name been something like Francine. Save Francine. The line is so clunky and stupid that Lois Lane is forced to helicopter across town just so she can try to explain it to Batman. Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name. It's his mother's name. Thanks, Lois, for reminding us that you are the worst character in this entire franchise. Which brings me to number five. Lois Lane is the worst character in this entire franchise. Hey, do you guys remember when I made that Star Wars review and I said some of the female characters sucked and then a bunch of blue checks on Twitter called me an incel man baby for the next six months? Well, let's do that whole thing again. Now look, Amy Adams is a good actress. She was great in the criminally underrated Arrival. She played a fantastically spooky bitch in The Master and I really think she knocked it out of the park as Jim's girlfriend on The Office. But as Lois Lane, she is Awful. Again, because these scripts are so bad as to defy explanation. In every scene, she is a doe-eyed idiot who has no idea what's going on. In Zack Snyder's universe, Lois exists for only three reasons. One, to have annoyingly long and pointless romance scenes with Superman. Two, for her to be in lazy exposition scenes that exist only to give the audience some sense of what the hell is going on. If that thing is making Earth more like Krypton, won't you be weaker around it? Maybe. And three, as a deus ex machina who lazily helps move the plot along, either as a helpless victim or as a dumbass who randomly shows up to toss the magic kryptonite spear into a lake, then five minutes later almost die trying to retrieve the magic kryptonite spear from a lake. Also, she gets a scene where she doesn't know how to insert a USB stick all the way. Good going there, Lois. Point is, this is perhaps the most boring interpretation of Lois Lane I've ever seen. What happened to the fun, sassy city girl showing a big dumb hick how to cut loose? On a whole, I'd say it's been swell. Swell? Yeah. You know, Clark, um, there are very few people left in the world who feel comfortable saying that word. What word? Swell. Really? Oh, so it's kind of natural. Lois Lane isn't supposed to be just a helpless damsel in distress. She's supposed to be a strong, independent career woman who doesn't take from anybody. Daddy was 
a black belt. All I can say is thank God Zack Snyder had the sense to cut Lois's pointless B story from Beaver S. And we can all rest easy knowing that the death of this franchise ensures that we never have to find out why Lois was the key to everything. Lois Lane wasn't the key to anything, she was just awful. Seriously though, how hard is it to write decent female characters? Which brings me to my next point. Number five, Zack Snyder hates women. All right, now this one's for the social justice people. I'm actually going to virtue signal about fighting negative depictions of women in media. Y'all better move me up a notch on the progressive stack. Now I'll be real, that title is inflammatory. I don't actually think Zack Snyder hates women, but he does have a terrible habit of portraying them almost entirely as helpless victims. Either as a shortcut to adding emotional sympathy to a scene, or as another lazy way to move the plot along. Think I'm exaggerating? Let's take a look at all the helpless women in these movies. Ma Kent, Lady on the Roof, Little Girl, All These Little Girls, Token Muslim, The Senator, Lex Luthor's Asian Girlfriend, This Black Lady, All These Black Ladies, A Bunch of Asian Slaves, Jesus Christ, Drowning Schoolgirls, Deleted Scene with Iris West, Lois Lane, Lois Lane, Lois Lane, Lois Lane, Lois Lane, Lois Lane, Lois Lane. Now I know some smart aleck is gonna go into the comments and point out every time a male character was in a similar situation. But it seems like anytime a man gets in trouble, Zack Snyder typically has them doing something stereotypically masculine. Oil drilling, flying a jet, fighting some hot Kryptonian lady. Damn, she looks good. And whereas a military man asks hard questions of Superman. How do we know you won't one day act against America's interests? His female counterpart just says, I just think he's kind of hot. I'll just say this, you never see a scene of Superman flying around with a man gently cradled in his arms. You know, because that would be gay. Kind of like how when we do have a male victim, he's being force-fed candy in an almost homoerotic manner. I don't know, maybe I'm reaching. Point is, this isn't just me saying, oh, we've got to save the women. I've got plenty of love for the classic Save the Princess storylines. I play Zelda. Everybody loves Zelda. It's really just about lazy storytelling. Zack Snyder's commitment to this hyper-masculine universe he's created seems to treat women almost entirely as token victims. And no, Wonder Woman being a badass is not enough to balance it all out. Also, did you really have to redesign the Valkyrie outfit so that everybody's midriff is showing? Like, they were already pretty hot. Ah, whatever, it's your movie. Number six, all of the villains are terrible. Now, writing a good bad guy can definitely be a challenge. Just look at the Marvel movies, which despite their success are full of completely forgettable villains, such as Murder Smurf, Hulk's cousin, and Roid Rage. Thing is, the Marvel movies are loud, colorful popcorn entertainment, and they sell themselves by visual spectacle alone. But Zack Snyder promised us a more serious take on the superhero genre, and that should have included villains with truly interesting motivations. Not just, I want to turn Earth into a copy of my home world, or I want to turn Earth into a copy of my home world. Now of the DCEU villains, clearly Doomsday and Steppenwolf are at the bottom of the barrel. A pair of CG monstrosities about as thrilling as Victorian era pornography. Yeah, show me those stocking tops, you filthy ho Michael Shannon's Zod comes closest to being a great villain, but again, his motivations don't really make sense. Why exactly does he want to turn Earth into Krypton? What does he miss, the, the dragons? Does he miss the weird Etch-A-Sketch video phones, which I don't understand how that's better than just a TV? And I get that he wants to use the magic skull inside of Superman to reproduce the glorious Kryptonian race, but why don't you just settle down on Earth and be worshipped as a literal god? It seems to be working out pretty good for Superman. Now, I like to think that the best villains usually act as the ideological opposite of the hero. That's why the Joker is such a perfect foil for Batman. Batman is the ultimate embodiment of societal order believing the world can be fixed once all the bad guys are behind bars. Conversely, Joker is the ultimate embodiment of chaos, believing that any attempt to impose order on an inherently chaotic universe is a ridiculous joke. On the other hand, the character of Superman represents empathy and compassion, the idea that the strong should protect the weak. Whereas the best depictions of Lex Luthor show him as a ruthless pragmatist, a man who believes the weak are beyond saving and exist only to be ruled by the strong. What would you do if you had his powers? Help people? You probably would. You lack the imagination to see the alternatives. That's why this version of Lex Luthor is the worst villain in the entire franchise. Because he doesn't seem to believe in anything. 
He seems to be some sort of religious nut job obsessed with angels and demons. And, he, and he's mad at Superman because I, I, his dad beat him as a kid. I don't fucking know. No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fists and abominations. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. He just doesn't have any clear ideology. He, he's really just a crazy person, and being crazy is the most boring possible motivation for a villain. Compare Luther to somebody like Thanos, who is compelling because he has an ideology. He believes in something, and what he believes differs from everything the heroes stand for. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. That's what creates the conflict at the center of the movie, and it's very compelling. Jesse Eisenberg, as a B-grade version of the Joker, is not. In fact, this Lex Luthor is so bad that he's getting a second entry on the list. Number seven, Lex Luthor's plan makes no sense. Now, if you wanna play a fun game, find somebody who likes Beaver S and ask them to explain Lex Luthor's plan in full. This is an impossible task because Lex Luthor's plan makes absolutely no sense and forces the audience to accept that Lex Luthor is an Omega level telepath who somehow knows everything about every single character in the movie, including where they are, where they are going, what they are thinking, and how they will react to the complete nonsense he's concocted. Let's just look at the first part of Lex Luthor's plan and all the things he somehow knows for no reason whatsoever. One, Lex Luthor somehow knows Superman's secret identity. Clark, Joseph, this is what allows him to construct a plot using Lois Lane as bait. I'm actually going to allow the movie a gimme and say that this one is fine. But then we move to number two, where Lex Luthor also somehow knows Lois Lane's schedule, finding out that she's going to San Gaffistan to hang out with ISIS. Not only that, but he knows her schedule so far in advance that he has enough time to hire a private team of mercenaries to join the bad guys before she gets there. I mean, what, you can just show up and join ISIS, I guess? Okay, sure. Number three, he also somehow knows that Lois Lane's photographer is going to be a CIA agent. And he knows that that agent has a secret transmitter in his camera. Camera. This is a necessary part of his plan because he needs his goon to reveal the secret transmitter, putting Lois Lane's life in danger. So I guess we're forced to assume that Lex Luthor somehow has the ability to influence the assignment of CIA operatives? I thought he owned Facebook. What, what is going on? Number four, he also somehow knows that Lois Lane will be taken hostage rather than just immediately shot in the head. Number five, he also knows that Superman will show up to save Lois Lane, but only after the village has been massacred. This is despite them clearly showing in these movies that Superman can instantly show up the second Lois Lane is in danger. So I don't know why this time he had to wait until all the black people were dead. Maybe Lex Luthor knew he was secretly racist? I don't know. Number six, he also knows that Superman will be blamed for this massacre, despite the fact that the bodies are clearly littered with bullets and shrapnel. Not to mention that a CIA drone camera is watching the whole thing. Again, this is just step one of Luther's plan. I'm not even getting into the bomb wheelchair and the, the checks with the weird messages on them, kryptonite that he wants Batman to have, but he, why don't you just give it to Batman? Why is the chase just, just leave it in a place where he can have it? Point is these constant leaps of logic just disorient the audience. It's very hard to enjoy a movie when you're constantly asking questions about the plot. Why is Congress blaming Superman for this? Why is the world's greatest detective not able to consider that Superman was obviously framed? And why did this supposedly brilliant mastermind give his troops special LexCorp bullets that can be directly traced back to him? This is the exact kind of nonsense logic that ruined The Last Jedi. Between these two movies, I honestly have to wonder whether script writers are getting stupider or just phoning it in because the audience have proven themselves willing to watch pure trash. I honestly don't know which is worse. Number eight, Joss Whedon is not a miracle worker. So after the disappointment of both Batman vs Superman and Harley Quinn's Hot Topic merchandise adventure, watching Justice League was kind of like having someone piss all over your shit Sunday. It already tasted like shit, so adding a bunch of piss to it really wasn't all that shocking. Really, the only truly surprising part of the movie was just how 
f***ing boring it was. I really don't know how you can hand someone $300 million, as well as the rights to five of the most exciting comic heroes in history, only for them to make a movie about a bunch of people arguing in an ugly airplane hangar. Stop arguing. Go, go punch things. Now, after the release of Batman vs. Superman, Warner Brothers executives kind of lost their minds. We put Batman and Superman in the same film and made less money than a Ryan Reynolds movie? What the f***? So after Zack Snyder turned in his first cut of Justice League, he stepped down from the project, which is a fun Hollywood way of saying he got fired. Wait, what? Fired? Yeah. So you've now got a half-finished Zack Snyder movie, another dark, gritty romp through this supposedly realistic superhero universe. And who do you get to polish it up? Joss Whedon, known exclusively for his bright, colorful characters, fun, quirky dialogue, and cheating on his wife. Now, it's obvious what Warner Brothers was thinking. They wanted to throw a Marvel-colored paint job all over their dark, gritty movie, and they decided to get the guy who helped the Avengers make a billion dollars at the box office. But I think it's obviously insane to try and turn a Zack Snyder movie into a Joss Whedon movie. Their two styles are almost the polar opposites of each other. So what exactly did Joss Whedon add to this movie to supposedly make it better? Number one, they added more Hallmark moments. Sappy nonsense like Superman inspiring children or him in the Flash saving Russian apartment buildings. These scenes are basically Whedon's trademark and boy does he ladle them on thick. But here they just feel inserted at random and don't fit the tone of the movie at all. Oh look, Superman loves Lois Lane. Now let's hard cut to Batman firing a laser gun at space bugs. It just doesn't work. Number two, dumb jokes. Now sure, I got a quick chuckle out of Aquaman sitting on the lasso of truth. I don't wanna die. I'm young, there's shit that I wanna do. But again, these moments don't really seem to fit into the scenes that Snyder has already directed. We'll be in the middle of a very serious Zack Snyder scene, only for one of the characters to randomly say something stupid to try and lighten the mood. Shut yourself down for a century, so let's not talk about me moving on. You know that if she kills you, we'll cover for her. <laughs> Number three, changing the lighting. I think it's obvious that this was a huge mistake. It seems clear to me that Zack Snyder purposefully sets up his shots to look good when bathed in shadows. And those same scenes look like a bunch of people in cheap Halloween costumes when you try to brighten up the lighting. Maybe this is subjective, but looking at the footage from the original trailers compared to what we eventually got, I think it's clear that the original color grading worked much better. And I know there's a bunch of YouTube videos about how brightening up Man of Steel supposedly would have made it a better movie, but honestly, Zack Snyder's visual style is the best part of all of these movies. I know they wanted to brighten up the tone of the movie, but I don't know why that means you also have to brighten up the lighting. Now look, I can't really give Joss Whedon too much shit. Trying to turn a Zack Snyder film into a family-friendly Marvel movie is an impossible task. I also really can't blame Zack Snyder. While his first cut of the movie might be as bad as people say, it's still quite possible he could have found a way to make the movie work. In fact, if anyone's to blame, it's Warner Brothers for desperately trying to copy popular trends rather than let the director they hired run with his original vision. It also doesn't help that they clearly wrote this movie off as a loss and completely slashed the special effects budget. Not only do we have Superman's weird computer-generated lip, but they also clearly told the CG animators, just stop, whatever you got now, just render it out, and we don't care. And as far as reshoots go, you get one cop. One cop car is gonna show up. Six superheroes are fighting in the middle of the city. There's one cop. That's the only guy who's around to deal with it. So at the end of the day, we have an ugly, boring, unfinished movie. A product designed in a corporate boardroom, lacking any real artistic soul. What a sad way for this trilogy to end. Anyway, I guess that's it. This week, we'll watch the adventures of Fishboy and Aquaworld, and watch as the strange, sad experiment known as Zack Snyder's DC Universe comes to an end. Many of the people involved have already moved on. Henry Cavill is playing Legolas. Ben Affleck realized that when you win the Golden Globe for Best Director, you're supposed to keep directing movies. And the guy who played The Flash just got a job as assistant manager of a Togo's subs. So I guess things are working out for everybody. Now, on a more personal note, I wanna say that these movies came out at a very weird time in my life. A time when I too was suffering through a number of personal failures. As such, I want to say this, Zach, on the very unlikely chance that you just sat through a 20 minute YouTube video shitting all over your work, please know that I rip on you because I love you. 
You are a man of many talents, your visual style is honestly unparalleled, and I think you've proven that given the right project, you're able to deliver some truly classic cinema. Yes, these movies are failures, but I also think that there's a certain nobility in failure in taking a long, hard look at where you went wrong and using that knowledge to propel your work to ever greater heights. I honestly look forward to whatever you do next, and I think your talents will truly sing when they aren't shackled to a billion-dollar toy franchise. In conclusion, I just have one final thing I want to say. Release the Snyder Cut! Do it! Hey guys, this is Vito. Thank you so much for watching. This video took a lot longer than I expected. It took me about a month of writing, recording, editing, and I really hope you guys like the final product. If you aren't already subscribed, come on. I mean, uh, I'm a small creator. Really, every subscriber helps. And don't forget to click the bell next to the button. YouTube kind of has me on a bit of a blacklist because I don't exactly make family-friendly content. So if you really want to see my videos when they go live, definitely click the bell. I'm hoping I can keep doing long-form videos like this. But unfortunately, these videos don't really make a lot of ad revenue. Point is, I want to thank all of my patrons. You guys definitely help make these videos possible. I also want to thank everybody who backed my card game, Enemy Weapon. If you missed out on the Kickstarter and you still want to get in, I've set up a website at enemyweapon.com. Anyway, it's been a hell of a year. I'm uh, happy this YouTube thing is still working out. People seem to be liking my channel. My audience is slowly growing, and I'm hoping I can keep coming up with ways to entertain you guys. Peace and love in 2019, and we will be back in the new year with more awesome videos. Love you guys. Peace.